hello and welcome to the webinar, Occupational Therapy and Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder. My name is Carla and I'm the National CPD and Events Coordinator for Occupational Therapy Australia. And I'll be moderating the session. Before we commence, I'd like to remind everyone of just a few housekeeping points. This webinar will run for approximately two hours and will be recorded. The recording will be sent to you via email by Thursday, April, February. I have muted all attendees in order to prevent background noise coming through. As time is limited, but if you have any questions during the webinar, I would like to ask all attendees to please type them in the Q&A panel rather than the chat feature. This way, any unanswered questions can be saved and forwarded onto the presenter at the end of the session. If you happen to have any technical difficulties, you're more than welcome to use the chat that way. I can reply to you directly. Please note that copies of the presentation along with all supporting documents and links are not for distribution and are the property of the presenter. I would like to welcome Jessica Hannon, who is presenting this webinar to you. Jessica Hannon is the National Projects Officer for the National Organization for Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder, as well as a Pediatric Occupational Therapist based on the New South Wales coast. She has hands-on experience working with children living, living with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, as well as knowledge-based support success. As part of the National Organization for FAD, Jessica is passionate about assisting occupational therapists guiding their practice to ensure the best outcomes for their clients. I will now pass over to you, Jessica, to begin the session. Thank you, Carla. And um, I do apologise for the few technical issues and for running a little bit late. Um, we will be going a bit less than two hours, so um, there'll be plenty of time for question time afterwards. Um, and happy to pass on my details to answer any specific questions that participants might have. Um, so just very quickly as well to begin with, um, I'd like to say that No FASD Australia seeks to be inclusive, consultative and authentic in its engagement with and rec recognition of the traditional owners of Australia. Uh, no FASD is, the, is a national organisation and therefore acknowledges all groups of traditional owners on whose land we meet today, regardless of whether this meeting is face-to-face -face or created through technology. No FASD Australia uh, respects the unbroken ownership and the cultural ex expressions of Australia's traditional owners, which reach beyond all recorded history in the world. Um, so again, thank you all for um, meeting with me this afternoon um, all over Australia, which is really exciting. Um, I'm based here in New South Wales, and I do appreciate that it's probably um, verging a bit a bit longer onto people's dinner times, but. Um, I really hope you guys get a lot out of this webinar today. And as I said, we're very approachable here at No FASD and happy to answer any following questions um, if you, um, in the following days as well. Um, so I'll just, sorry, I'll just tell you Carla when to flick slides. So um, just flick to the next one, please. Um, so these are our learning objectives today. So hopefully I'm hoping that you guys will walk away um, knowing what exactly fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is, but specifically as well, um, there is the new diagnostic tool, and I hope to kind of uh, give you familiarise you, you, you guys with um, with the tool, so you can look at it and start to apply it to practice really well. So we're just going to flick to the next slide as well, um, and these are our learning outcomes. So this is ultimately, um, you know, if you don't feel like we've met these, then please let me know. I'm always open to um, changing things up and making things a little bit better. So. Just before we get started, um, we are going to do some true and false questions. And I really want you to sit down and think about what your knowledge of FASD is um, before we get going. So we're going to start um, with some poll questions and Carla's going to help me out with getting that sorted. Um, so we're just going to watch and see, you know, what we already know about FASD, which is really, really exciting. So if you could get that up, Carla, please. So, the first question, and I also kind of hope that these, these true and false questions, you know, debunk some of the big myths about FASD. So, I just flip to the next slide, Carla. Okay, so the first one. An occasional glass of wine throughout my pregnancy won't put my baby at risk of FASD. So we'll give you about 15 seconds to um, respond to these, Q and, these true and false questions.
All right, and who hasn't heard this, this little one-liner quote um, before as well? It's a very common thing that uh, women can say to each other. All righty, okay. Carla, if we can flick to the next one. So that one is indeed a false. All right, just flick to the next slide, Carla, please. So um, there has been no proven safe amount of alcohol that can be consumed um, during pregnancy. Um, the National Health and Medical Research Council and the World Health Organization advise that um, women abstain from drinking alcohol during pregnancy and breastfeeding. So there, essentially, there's been no safe limit that has been established. There's been no, um, you know, small amounts of alcohol that has been proven to be safe. So, you know, it is the best message as ourselves as OT is that also with our working health promotion that we really need to be pushing that there is no safe amount of alcohol which can be consumed during pregnancy. So that is um, supported by the National Health and Medical Research Council and the World Health Organization. And, you know, it is common for that first statement to come up, to come up quite a lot because, you know, those, um, that advice was different, you know, a few years ago. So it has changed. So that's why we need to be really wary and proactive in what we're doing and making sure that we actually do know the, the best evidence and um, advice out there. Okay, the next slide, please, Carla, for the next question. So, FASD is a problem for Aboriginal communities and lower socioeconomic populations. Alrighty, 15 seconds is up. Okay, let's flick to the next slide. So that one is indeed false. Um, and that I guess is another big thing that I'd really like to get across from this webinar that um, if you flick to the next slide, that FASD is not just an Indigenous issue, you know, wherever there is alcohol, there is a chance for FASD. Um, although, you know, Indigenous populations are very, um, with the statistics do show that there can be an elevated level of FASD in their population, but they're also a very heavy popu um, research population. Um, the Lily One Project, um, which, you know, was led by community leaders, gave us some of the most um, insightful and fascinating information into FASD, but, you know, that's where a lot of our research comes from. So we really need to acknowledge that. And, and the big message that wherever there is alcohol, there is FASD. And we have this new emerging trend of the high socioeconomic status, which is a very um, strong predictor for alcohol use. Um, especially uh, middle-aged, well-educated women who are in that corporate role that might be um, consuming alcohol with, they might not know they're pregnant yet, but they're consuming alcohol as a part, a part of that job role. So um, it's really important not to neglect this, this other side and just think it's a lower socioeconomic um, status on Indigenous issue. Um, we, if we have clinicians working in metropolitan and city areas, we need to be very FASD aware um, because the information we do know is that you know, older mothers are less likely to stop drinking as opposed to younger women. So 90% of women aged 25 or under um, will stop drinking, but those uh, only 50% over 36 um, reported that they stopped drinking. So it's definitely not just, um, you know, younger women, less educated or um, that Indigenous population. And I hope that's a really big factor that we take away from today. Um, but also give praise to that Indigenous population because a lot of those populations put their hands up and um, asked for help and really needed that help. And they, they took those clinicians on in those studies and um, they changed um, some of their lives. So that's a big um, testament to that wonderful population, especially with the Lily One project. All right, so next question, please, Carla. Yep. All right, then we can duck across to the next slide. Cool. Oh, oh wonderful. I can see the poll now. Oh. 
So the next question, Australian women are drinking more and at harmful levels. Yep, all right, let's bring up the next slide and find out the answer to that one. True. Um, so the rates of alcohol use, binge drinking and drinking during pregnancy are actually increasing in young Australian women. Um, the, you know, some really big protective factors of women drinking alcohol um, was indeed that of poverty um, and equality. And although it's amazing, it is great that, you know, those things have diminished, but they were some really protective factors um, that stopped a lot of uh, young uh, women drinking. And now that we have um, gotten rid of those wonderful, horrible things, um, we have actually seen an increase in the rate. Um, religion is also a very big protective factor of women drinking, but um, a lot of women um, in modern society are steering away from religion. So that is actually leading to an increase in women um, statistically drinking throughout Australia. Okay, next question, please. Okay. No one can predict whether an alcohol exposed pregnancy will lead to as Dean a child. Okay, let's find out that answer. True. Um, yeah, so based on current data estimates uh, indicate that one in every 13 women who consumed alcohol during pregnancy will have a child with FASD. And we will talk about the spectrum of birth defects as well as you know the multiple causes not just alcohol that can lead to um, the presentation of this disorder so um, that is isn't something that we will touch on again but you know that no doctor or no health professional can look at a mother and you know guarantee that their child won't have FASD and you know, this new new very new statistic that one in every 13 women is, is pretty scary and overwhelming all right next question So the effect of alcohol on a fetus is the same for all pregnancies. This is a good one. Okay, let's get the answers for that one. False. So, um, so as I spoke about, about before, you know, we have a spectrum of birth defects. So that's why it's fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And this is primarily due to the quantity of alcohol consumed, how frequently it's consumed, and the timing during gestation or during the pregnancy when the alcohol is confused. And as I said, we will touch on this later again. Um, but there are some other factors that we, um, we can include, such as the mother's maternal age, um, her nutritional deficiencies, um, her ability to metabolize alcohol, and um, other comorbidities of physical and mental illnesses. And we do know that um, women who are in very stressful environments, who um, might not have access to proper nutrition, um, who might have pre-existing medical conditions, 
um, you know, they can be other significant factors that, you know, um, lead to a child being born with um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So, you know, alcohol is, a, is definitely the, um, the main precursor, but there is also other factors, which is why not every woman who drinks the same amount of alcohol will have the same effects on her baby. Um, that's why it's so different from each case. And in that sense, it's really hard to get a strong message across um, because you often hear in mother's clubs or play group that they might say, oh, I drank, you know, three times during my pregnancy and my child is fine. Or, and then you might get a mother and she had one big binge, binge drinking episode and that led to a child with FASD. So we really can't tell because um, every mother is so different and every pregnancy is so different. So that's why that message of um, no alcohol is the safest choice definitely needs to be spread. Okay. So let's flick to the next question. So drinking during, during pregnancy is just as harmful as taking other recreational drugs. Alrighty, let's get that answer up. Great, true. Um, so with alcohol, um, it is just as harmful as recreational drugs such as nicotine, cocaine and methamphetamine. So the actual impact on the fetus is a lot different um, and I'm not going to talk about drugs and alcohol during, pre um, I mean drugs during pregnancy, I'm sorry because um, that's not bad D, but um, we do know that it is just as harmful and um, in some cases more harmful than taking um, recreational drugs. But um, the damage from alcohol is a permanent brain injury and that's what we really need to be pushing. And obviously, you know, if there are other drugs consumed during pregnancy, it can have a myriad of, of effects. Um, so, yeah, so we're going to move on to the next one, which is our last question. So children will outgrow the difficulties caused by alcohol consumption during pregnancy. Okay, let's get that answer up. So that is a big fault. Um, so FASD is a whole body and a lifelong condition um, and it really needs to be supported throughout their lifespan, not just from when they're children. So we do know that uh, problems that emerge in childhood do not disappear with age, um, but rather that does serve as a bit of a platform for additional and possibly more severe, severe disorders later in life. So um, early diagnosis and early de detection is definitely um, what we're pushing to try and get the supports in while they're young so they can be progressed throughout their adulthood. Um, but it's very common for for what I hear when people talk to me and say that they'll grow out of it, it's just a behavioural thing and it's really important to press that it is a permanent brain injury. Okay, so we are going to continue on. So now I've quizzed you all a little bit and got you thinking about some myths or questions and I actually got some of these questions from my sister who is currently pregnant and a lot of these things is what people said to her. Um, and we were, try we were, you know, working together to debunk, debunk those, those myths and, um, get some more knowledge out there. So it's great to have done that with you guys to see where you guys are at with your FASD knowledge. And I'm hoping that after this webinar, you'll um, um, have a lot more confidence and be able to you know, train it forward to other people and teach other people your knowledge that you've sustained today.
So we are going to move on and I'm going to teach you a little bit more about FASD and no more quizzing. <laughs> so we can flip the slides, please, Carla. So what is FASD? And you can flick across the next one, yeah, thank you. So FASD um, is the, I guess, the acronym we use to describe fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And that is um, the term used to describe the physical and neurodevelopmental disorders that result from fetal alcohol exposure. So in Australia, um, we have two diagnoses of FASD, which we will go through. Um, FASD with three sentinel facial features and FASD without Three cents or less than three sentinel facial features. Um, FASD is now one of the most serious harms caused by alcohol from the time the child is conceived right through to death. To death. Um, FASD can be prevented, but at the moment in Australia, it's the leading cause of non genetic developmental disability. So we're going to flick across again, please, Carla. Um, as I said, it's a serious public health issue and there are more individuals born with FASD than autism spectrum disorder, spina bifida, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome and sudden infant death syndrome combined. So it is very prevalent in, in Australia and a serious public health issue. So who is at risk? As we spoke about before and we did that true and false myth busting that women from all cultures and socioeconomic backgrounds um, are at risk to FASD. Um, it does not discriminate in any way, so any child who drinks alcohol during pregnancy can put their unborn child at risk. So populations at the highest risk, so we, we spoke about this before, um, you know, one in four women drink even though, even though they know they are pregnant, which is a very high percentage. And we spoke about, you know, the high socioeconomic status has been a strong predictor for alcohol use. Um, and this, this uh, statistic at the bottom of the study, you know, data from the National Drug and Alcohol Survey reports that although only 20% of Aboriginal women drink during pregnancy, those who do drink at a risky level, which um, is a really, um, you know, that, that study has come from an Indigenous population and some of those women were drinking more than 10 standard drinks um, per day. So, you know, statistically speaking, less of um, Indigenous women are actually drinking during their pregnancy, but those who do are drinking at risky levels. So, what causes FASD? So, oh, I see if you've, yeah, what causes FASD? I was just seeing if you guys had caught up because I can see the presentation on my laptop. Um, so, FASD, as it says, is caused when alcohol is consumed during pregnancy. So, alcohol is a, what we call a teratogen, which is something that can cause an embryo to not form correctly. So alcohol alters the structure of cells, reducing the ability of nerves to correctly function. This is because the insulating uh, layer of fatty tissue around some nerve cells and interconnecting cells do not develop properly. This process is called myelination. And if the fatty tissue does not grow, such as our myelin, um, the shells cannot communicate. So the central nervous system is unable to function at speeds um, that it should typically be functioning at because the fatty tissue is like an electrical conductor and the messages aren't being passed through. So FASD is an acquired brain injury, so we need to be looking at it in that sense. And um, the brain injury is the myelin sheaths are either not there or poorly formed, so that's what we're dealing with. Um, also very important um, with the, to the teratogen aspect of it, that alcohol very freely crosses the placenta and creates the blood alcohol level in the fetus the same or higher than that of the mother. So we really need to look back and think that the fetus does have a very small unformed liver. It takes a lot longer for them to metabolize alcohol. So this is why it remains in the, ba the baby's system for so much longer and causes a lot more damage. Um, so that is the ins and outs of what FASD is. And, um, I, I know a lot of um, therapists that I speak to and they know FASD um, causes, you know, behavioural problems or, you know, the facial features, but they're not quite sure about what the actual brain injury is. And I hope that was very clear and you can walk away and say it very clearly that, it's, that there's no myelin sheath. And the reason why FASD is so permanent is we haven't discovered ways to grow myelin sheath um, in research. So that's what it all comes down to. So um, we probably all really remember this from our neuroanatomy days. So this is just um, an example of a nerve fibre 
and you know we put it in comparison to an electrical wire you know electrical wire has a plastic insulation that helps it bounce the communication from um the cells um so we do sometimes also describe children with fasd being very unpredictable like an open electrical wire so if you look here that this end of the wire doesn't have any insulation of it and we know that that can be very unpredictable and that's a very common um, reference I get to um, children who are living with FASD that their behaviour is very unpredictable. They're very impulsive. So they're getting some of the current of that neural activity, but it's not quite reaching the next one, um, which can you know, add to their impulsivity and unpredictability. So next slide, please, Carla. Um, so as I spoke about before, I jumped the gun a little bit. We've got no cure to FASD. Um, and as we spoke about in the myth, that it is a permanent brain injury. We haven't developed how to grow myelin sheaths and these individuals need to be supported for their entire life. Obviously, depending on what um, level of impairment they have, but um, this is a lifelong, lifelong disorder that we really need to be inclusive and aware of because we were um, most certainly be working with individuals who will be living with it, whether they're diagnosed or not. Um, that was just a little picture of a typical neuron. Um, and if this part, uh, if any of part of that is damaged prior to birth, is very unlikely it will regenerate. As we spoke about, it will not grow back. Um, we essentially we can't form what we what we don't really have um, there. So it's different to to, to different types of um, neuroplasticity there. Okay, Carlos, so we're going to jump to the next one. Um, so this slide shows the risk um, of the developing fetus across gestation. Um, so the dark green um, sides of the, the graph, which is primarily on the left-hand side, uh, denotes highly sensitive period um, of fetal development. And note the central nervous system is developing from the third week of pregnancy and the brain in the 20th to 36th weeks of pregnancy. So you can only guess what may happen when alcohol is consumed prior to confirmation of pregnancy, which is usually not until the fifth or sixth week, especially if it's unplanned. Uh, in that time, the brain and central nervous system, skeletal and major organs, ears, eyes, teeth, and genitalia are all developing and may already be damaged if alcohol has been consumed. And of course, right up until the end, the fetus is still developing, so alcohol can cause problems. And I really like to use this slide as well because there is such a big spectrum of, um, of de um, you know, if we have physical defects. If we look at this slide, you can see if the mother might have been drinking during the six weeks of pregnancy, that's when we might have the small palate, the ear malformation uh, with the railroad ears, which is another sign, um, and the teeth. So you can see, this is why the spectrum is so different, because if a mother drinks in different, different times of fetal development, it's going to have dif different effects on that child. So, and that is just a very simple um, gestational graph that um, is used very commonly. So, um, we can apply it in the sense of when alcohol is drunk during critical times of development, and we're never quite sure, each pregnancy is so different about what specific week or time the fetus is developing. So that's why, again, that message of no alcohol is safe during the pregnancy is so important. So we're gonna to flick to the next slide, and I do hope no one in New South Wales is eating dinner at the moment. Um, so this is what, um, a brain image of a child that has been affected by alcohol consumption during pregnancy on our right to comparison to a child that um, has not has any exposure, exposure to alcohol during pregnancy. Um, so this is of course a very extreme example and I'm just putting in this in here to pretty much show you the difference in not only the size of the brain but that we are missing some structures and especially those lovely cerebral folds there are definitely not as many there. So yeah, this is just a very, I guess, um, extreme way to show the differences. And, you know, we don't get information from brain scans or um, from doing brain scans. as Lesions don't always show up. Um, and, you know, microcephaly is very common. So as you can see on the, the child that's been affected by SAS, they have a very small brain size and they will have a very small head circumference as well. So that's when we'll look at that. But we will go into that a little bit further. I'm jumping the gun again probably a little bit. So we will also just jump to the next slide, please, Carla. Um, this is a brain scan. Um, and as I said before, we don't use brain scans for diagnosis, um, as lesions sometimes can be too small to be detected, but still large enough to cause significant disabilities for the child. 
So again, we've used a very extreme example here. Um, it's come out of Chicago um, of what a scan um, for a typical developing child on the left compared to a child that's been affected by FADS uh, for alcohol consumption during pregnancy. And this is in a, a very commonly used um, brain scan as well. But we can also see some structural deformities. So we've got a flattened face. We've got that smaller head size. We do have those fewer folds in the brain, the smoother surface of the brain, and an underdeveloped inner structure of the brain. So this is a very extreme example. And, um, it, you know, we don't always see this if they do brain scans, if they choose to. But as I said, it's not in their diagnostic criteria. So we will jump to the next slide, please, Carla. Um, as I've been probably saying it down your throat, we do have no safe time to drink alcohol during pregnancy and there is no safe amount. Um, so no alcohol, we do recommend. So if you're planning to get pregnant during pregnancy or breastfeeding, that no alcohol is consumed um, during pregnancy. Okay. So we will flick to the next one and we're going to talk about maternal alcohol use. And, you know, unfortunately, the first thing a mother does when they find out that their child has FASD is to blame themselves. Um, but we do know that no mother intentionally tries to harm their, un their unborn child. And the worst things we can really do is judge a mother with if her child does have FASD. FASD is more than just drinking alcohol during pregnancy. It is a result of a lack of knowledge around drinking while pregnant. Um, and if you are not planning to become pregnant, you might as well be drink. You may well be drinking in that vital time when the central nervous system is developing. So if you enjoy having that afternoon wine with your partner, you have not heard really of FASD or you've never come along it in your friendship group, and you are very surprised you're pregnant, the chances are quite increased. Um, and as this this stat here shows as well, that research shows that 50 to 60 percent of Australian women drink during pregnancy. So we still have a lack of, a very lack of information during um, this current population. Okay, we're gonna to flick to the next slide and I'll just likely just um, discuss the life and health outcomes for people with FASD as they are very poor. So life expectancy for a child um, with FASD was 34 years, which is about 42% of that of the general population. So 19% of deaths are caused by mental health issues and suicide. Um, the second leading cause of death is accidents. So um, individuals getting themselves into situations they can't quite get themselves out of, or they um, might forget, they, their memory is very impacted, they might forget to look across the road and um, walk in front of a truck. So that might not necessarily be a suicide, which is actually a lot of, um, this is coming out of the United States, it's not necessarily a suicide, they um, just don't remember to do things and that can lead them to getting into um, quite serious issues. 90% of individuals with FASD will have a co-occurring mental health issue. Um, depression and suicidal ideation is the most common. And we do also know that, um, you know, mothers who have a child with FASD, they go through a whole grieving process and are very um, subjected to, oh, um, yeah, I guess that's the word, subjected to depression themselves and suicidal tendencies um, just because of that guilt factor. So we, when when we're working in, a family-centred way, we really need to be looking at those mothers and supporting them as best we can and leading them in a, in a direction where they can get support for themselves and their child. Uh, young people are 19 times more likely to be incarcerated than those without FASD and it is heavily misdiagnosed um, for autism, spectrum disorder, ADHD con and conduct disorder, which can lead to inappropriate medication and health interventions. Um, I get a lot of calls from um, other therapists saying that um, this child's got autism, but it's all my interventions that I usually work aren't quite working or um, like they're going for an ADHD diagnosis, but I'm just not sure they're going to meet the full criteria because there's just a few things not missing. And sometimes when we do delve deeper, we do find out about the, um, the pregnancy history and later that child is diagnosed with FASD. Um, so I, it's often described as, you know, it does present heavily with similar to sometimes to ADHD, conduct disorder and ASD. And, and certainly it can co-present, there can be two co-presentations, but um, a lot of the time, it, if it's not a co-presentation, they will kind of meet the criteria, but just not meet the mark. And um, that's when we get, we get quite puzzled and a little bit confused. So it's why we really need to be having that FASD lens, especially when working with young people, just so we can get that early intervention diagnosis happening as quickly as possible. 
So we will move on to um, the diagnosis, um, the types and processes of FASD. So, so FASD um, is that umbrella term we spoke about. And in Australia, we have here on this side, FASD with three sentinel facial features and FASD with three and less sentinel facial features. And I've just put this slide in here um, just for your reference because um, the terminology has changed. So you might see, um, you know, FAS, which was um, fetal alcohol syndrome or PFAS, which is partial fetal alcohol syndrome and these other acronyms on the side. But this is what's happened now is it's actually gone under these two umbrella terms. Um, so if you're reading literature, this is what you can um, align it with. So um, in Australia, as I said, we have two medical diagnoses of FASD. Um, for both diagnoses, they have to meet in severe impairment in at least three of the following neurodevelopmental domains. So um, you can see how um, children who have other diagnoses may co-present, and this, you know, we can say that um, not just people with FASD have language impairment, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to um, definitely get our good understanding around this. Um, and I'm sure you guys are all aware of all these headings mean as well. So um, visible differences are only part of the diagnosis and not necessarily a criteria for diagnosis. And the next slide here, I've um, literally taken this out of the diagnostic criteria. So if you're ever a little bit unsure about what the process might be, the Australian diagnostic criteria is available online and it is a wonderful resource, even just for further information about it. But this is the algorithm they use for the diagnosis of FASD. So, um, for example, if we, not, we aren't quite sure about the unknown side, we're not quite sure about the mother's alcohol use, you know, she, might, she may have passed away, she, the children may, may no longer be in care. They have met three neurodevelopmental day, domains of impairment. They have the three sentinel facial features. They will be diagnosed with FASD with three sentinel facial features. But on this other side here, if we're not quite sure about, we can't get confirmation of the alcohol consumption during pregnancy. They have met the impairment in three neurodevelopmental domains. They don't quite have, uh, that have less than three sentinel facial features. They will not get a FASD diagnosis. So if we can't get the confirmation of alcohol use, during pregnancy and they do not have the facial features, um, they will not get a diagnosis of FASD as that algorithm says. Um, if, for example, we have confirmed alcohol use during pregnancy, they haven't met the criteria, uh, they haven't met the three neurodevelopmental domains and they haven't got um, the three sentinel facial features, they will not get the FASD diagnosis. And this confirmed absent there, this is, we know that the mother did definitely not drink during pregnancy. So no FASD diagnosis, just that's a common one I commonly get asked about. So if you ever have any questions about what might be happening when they go for that, that diagnosis, um, this is a really helpful algorithm to um, get up. And it is, as I said, readily available in the diagnostic criteria. So in the next slide, I've just put it back together about our two diagnoses. So we've got FASD with three sentinel facial features, which we will be going through. We have Prenatal alcohol exposure, confirmed or not confirmed, but these kids have the three sentinel facial features, so we don't need confirmation. They've got neurodevelopmental impairment in at least three domains, and as I said, the facial features, so they've got FASD. The one on the right, um, oh, I've got the slides there, and I don't have the little less than. Sorry, guys, that's my fault. Um, we've got FASD with less than three central facial features, that's what it's meant to be. On the right hand side, we have confirmed prenatal alcohol exposure. We have um, impairment in at least three neuro neurodevelopmental domains. They may have zero, one or two facial features. So they have FASD with less than three central facial features. I do apologize for that little mix up there, guys. Okay, so to assess an individual who is suspected of FASD, um, the following criteria we really must be considered and ultimately it would be a multi by multidisciplinary team. So it would be best if we could get as much information about maternal alcohol use, her pregnancy history and possibly her other exposures to other drugs. Uh, we really need to look at the neurodevelopmental impairment as well as if we have any facial features. Um, so we do have a small amount, a small number of clinics in Australia, which I'll discuss at the end. However, they are, as I said, few in number. Um, and while where multidisciplinary teams aren't available as a, 
such as those great clinics, assessments may be conducted across a range of clinical settings over a period of time. So they may happen more in the community and then we will consolidate that assessment information and then it will be sent to the paediatrician or the clinics and they will make the final call. So we have here fetal alcohol spectrum disorder with three sentinel facial features. So this is a diagnosis that we are probably the most aware of and familiar with. Um, these features can be caused when alcohol is consumed by the mother on the 17th to the 20th day of pregnancy. So that's roughly the th third week. Um, and because there is visible differences in the face of a person who meets this criteria, it does not need to be confirmed if the mother drank. And there are always severe impairment. Um, they will also need the severe impairment in three neurodevelopmental domains. So um, the facial features that we're going to go through in a moment, um, they are specific for FASD. So um, that's why we don't need the confirmation of alcohol use. So they, the three sentinel facial features is the thin upper lip, the smooth silk trim, and the short palatal fissure, fissure length. And they do not vary by race, age, or gender. So an example. Um, outlines in the next slide here more detail about the eye. So a child with FASD with the facial features will have a smaller than average distance between A and B. There will also likely be a flap of skin between the nose and the corner of the eye, which is visible in this picture. You can also see a scale of lips that is similar to the one used in diagnosis. Uh, whereas one is the presence of um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, and five in, indicates a, oh, one indicates no presence of fetal alcohol um, alcohol during pregnancy, whereas five indicates a definite presence of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So they will um, most likely take five and four under the diagnostic um, in the diagnostic tool, but three, two, and one, um, there's been no effect on that facial feature um, during pregnancy on, as a result of alcohol use. Okay, and this was commonly known as fetal alcohol syndrome um, back in the day. So this picture summarises, you know, the main features of FASD. But to remember, it is the first diagnosis FASD with three sentinel facial features, which is those the the eye distance, the lip, the our lips above our a bump a bump above our lips and our thin lip size. So, but this is this is another one that kind of describes, um, it summarises some of the more main features um, that we look out for too. So skin folds at the corner of the eye, small eye opening, a nasal bridge. So this is where your glasses usually sit. It'll be lower. Uh, the flat face, uh, mid face may be flat or small. The nose may also be small. The filtrum will be smooth. The top lip will be thin and measurement around the head will be small. So it's really important that we can try and get birth records as well. Um, you know, our first, the first contact the baby might have when it's born because they, they will have done the head circumference size and we can bring that all to an assessment team. But um, we do know that those, some children, we won't get access to that information. So um, that's why diagnosis can be a little bit more tricky. So these are also some of the other physical admirations that can be associated with FASD. So, um, these can affect multiple things. Um, for example, poor vision, poor hearing loss, which is associated with now formed ears and eyes. Um, those highlighted in blue here are some of our most common ones. And probably as OTs, we can look at that sensory side and um, sensory processing is definitely um, a big difficulty for children affected by FASD. And it's something that they do have to live with. And we, um, I'll go through it a bit later on about how it has does impact on their function, and that is a result of the fe um, fetal alcohol exposure. Um, a very common one is also the crowded teeth and gum um, deviation. So there was actually a, a dentist working in South Australia, and he had um, previously lived in South Africa, where they used to pave their um, workers with wine. So a lot of the women were drinking alcohol during pregnancy and FASD over in South Australia is quite severe as well and um, it is a massive public health issue over there but he had worked with numerous children um, affected by FASD and they had a lot of this um, crowded teeth and dental problems and he actually um, directed one of our families that contacted us 
to a FASD specific clinician to get a diagnosis because he that was the first thing he noticed was a crowded teeth and everything else started to come around and that child was diagnosed with FASD. So that um, goes to show everyone's different experience with FASD is very interesting. Um, poor vision um, and the hearing loss is also very, very common as well with frequent ear infections um, as well. Okay, so we will move on to the next um, diagnosis, which is FASD with less than three sentinel facial features. And children with FASD and less than three sentinel facial features are the highest risk of misdiagnosis. It is often put down to the child's behaviour rather than their disability. Um, but visible features such as facial features are not always present. So they might have no facial features or they may have one or two. Um, the diagnosis process will confirm that the mother consumed alcohol during pregnancy. So we really need to know this information if the child doesn't have um, facial features. And it will confirm that um, the diagnostic process will also confirm that there's severe impairment in at least three of the neurodevelopmental domains. Um, but unfortunately, there is absolutely no difference in how the severe the dysfunction in the brain is, regardless of what we can actually see. Um, these diagnoses have, you know, a different um, criteria that are all the same in that there is the same kind of brain dam damage. And, you know, these children may be um, more or profoundly more affected by the alcohol exposure than those that have the facial features. So it's not just what we can see. So. Um, only 83% uh, of individuals with FASD do not display facial features. So only 17% of individuals will have the facial features. So you can, just from that statistic, you can see that that is a catalyst for misdiagnosis for, um, or underdiagnosis of FASD. As um, up until recently, a lot of people were only really aware of fetal alcohol syndrome or the facial features that are attached to it. So it's very important um, to know that there is a lot of these, these children um, and individuals and adults that are walking around our communities who have an acquired brain injury due to um, alcohol consumption during pregnancy, but they might have a list of a range of other diagnoses, but nothing that quite explains why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, so in Australia, there is no prenatal alcohol exposure threshold required for diagnosis. So while the quantity and frequency are assessed, um, they obviously look at when the mother drank and how much she drank. There is no threshold. Um, so confirming details of quantity, frequency and timing of prenatal alcohol exposure is difficult, um, if not impossible in some cases. So, and if we, for example, did set a prenatal alcohol exposure threshold, potentially we're sending the wrong public health message that low or moderate drinking in pregnancy below a diagnostic threshold is safe and then it does not cause FASD. So there is no threshold of effect that can be predicted for any mother and child given differences in exposure, fetal and maternal factors. So uh, if a mother um, spoke about she drank one or two or three times during a pregnancy or um, another family member um, confirmed that, that would be enough to meet criteria um, for the Australian Guide. So moving on, um, as I spoke about before in our true and false, just um, going over that, it is a spectrum of birth defects and it is associated with the quantity, the frequency and the timing of alcohol consumed during pregnancy. And that's a really good way to explain it to other people. You never know when your child's developing a certain system and there is no safe limit established. So we really need to be pushing for that no alcohol during any stage of pregnancy is fine. So in addition, people with FASD may also be diagnosed with the following disorders. So it is, they, they can have a co-diagnosis of autism, ADHD, reactive attachment disorder, conduct disorder, or oppositional defiance disorder. So it can be difficult for, for practitioners to, dis to distinguish from other developmental disorders since they do share some similar learning and behavioral problems. Um, so it is really important to get the correct diagnosis though. And um, if you would like to know some practitioners, um, if you're looking for a diagnosis, please contact NOFASD and we can um, assist you to find the closest practitioner to you. Um, which can help you out with your question about diagnosis. So I really like to put this slide in here as it shows the dysmaturity, which is a classic sign of FASD. So these children are developmentally, developmentally delayed in many areas at different levels. Um, it is a critical concept to understand for success when you're working with children with FASD. So 
uh, we've got this man here and he's 18 years old. That's his physical and his chronological age. He may actually have really good expressive language skills. So they, he can talk the talk. He can get that job at the hardware. Um, he has expressive language skills of a 20-year-old, which is very common for children with FASD to copy what he, they hear other people say and give off this false impression that um, they know what they're doing or they know what they're talking about, which can get them into some really, um, some really um, situations that they can't somewhat get themselves out of. Um, so he walks into his first job at the hardware and um, he has a reading ability of a 16-year-old. So his boss has given his orders um, by a list and he can't, can't quite understand them. Um, but he gets the whole, he kind of understands the concept, but can't quite put it into practice quite yet. Um, he's got the social skills um, and the emotional maturity of a six to seven year old. So he's been quite immature with the other work colleagues. Um, he doesn't quite pick up on some of the social cues that the adults may. And he's getting into a bit of argy bargy with his colleagues down at the hardware. Um, his money and time concepts are that of an eight year old. So he might need someone to prompt him to go to work on time and discuss the importance of it. He might also get his first paycheck from the hardware and um, spend it all on a really beautiful $400 jacket, which, you know, which isn't that great if you've got rent to pay and food to put on the table to eat that week. He's also got the living skills of 11 year old. Um, so he's coming to work. He's not dressed properly. He hasn't showered that morning. He needed someone to tell him to shower. Um, so I hope this gives you an understanding of the way that sometimes these individuals, these fast days, they go through their lifespan. They can sometimes function and get themselves into situations that may seem really good, but we do know that things like maintaining jobs can be really, really hard for them and they need supported employment um, depending on their deficits um, to keep them in those positions to lead them to you know, reduce that statistic of them going to um, becoming incarcerated. Um, also, moving on to the next slide, um, this is something that I guess as a PED OT um, I like to do, but it's also a really nice one to show a teacher. So if you're working with teachers in schools and you're in the community and you're, you really need to explain to the teacher why they're having so much trouble, this can be a really good um, slide to bring up. So this can be very confusing for parents and carers and teachers because the children seem to be at so many different ages. So we've got here that typical five-year-old, goes to school, follow those three instructions, sits still for 15 minutes, plays and takes turns. And I still would like to meet this five-year-old, but um, he definitely doesn't live on the South Coast. But in saying that, as we use that into a comparison with a FASD with a uh, five-year-old with FASD, he might need to take a nap at school. Um, he might he needs to follow one instruction at a time if he's shown it sits for five minutes and engages in parallel play, wants to play on play their own way. So he's actually acting quite younger than what he actually is. And I'll leave that bottom one there for you as I do realise I'm probably running a little bit um, not on the best schedule, but you do have access to these slides and I'm more than happy for you to show them to teachers to try and explain to them um, the effects on the brain. As, as we spoke about before, it's that acquired brain injury that we're working with. So why do we need to recognise FASD? So, the correct diagnosis provides a lens through which we can gain an understanding of the whole story and formulate targeted treatment plans. And we are very luckily getting um, a lot more research coming through about interventions, um, which is really exciting. Um, we really need to recognise the depth of the problem um, for future prevention. So we do know that if um, a mother's child is diagnosed with FASD, she's much less likely to drink in um, during her next pregnancy. Um, we also know that the mother is um, had a child with FASD as a result of an addiction, it can be a platform for her to get help. So it is really important in that sense as well. So it also provides an alert for other possible uh, underlying medical conditions. So um, as we look back at that um, slide with the gestational, um, the growing of the, um, the fetus during the gestation of the pregnancy, um, if they've drunk during, um, you know, when the heart is forming, we can get heart valve issues um, in, you know, they might have um, optic nerve issues. They might have, have problems um, with their vision and hearing as well. So it can be um, you know, a great pl a platform to um, investigate those other possibilities. Um, so there are different ways of working with individuals depending on their disability, of course. So um, the, the, the correct diagnosis means that not only are we able to help with FASD individuals and their families, but others as well in a way that best suits the individual. We know that much of the medication prescribed for other disorders do not work quite as well for individuals with FASD. Um, so we really need 
to be prescribing medication that is suitable. And there um, was some exciting research going on overseas, but I'm not quite sure if they've published their research yet about um, medication and FASD. Um, but as you can see, just from the way that the brain damage occurs, um, we've got that we don't have a myelin sheath. So medication is most likely to be a little bit um, the effects of it are going to be different, for example, a child that presents with ADHD and has myelin sheath. Okay, so here we go. We're going to go into some OT um, things, some um, discussions, not things. But firstly, I would also like to acknowledge um, some two really great OTs in the FASD world. So we've got Diana Barnett, who is at the Westmead Children's Hospital, and she has been of amazing help to myself, but is um, just got knowledge everywhere regarding FASD and um, does an amazing job down there at the diagnostic clinic. Um, and also Robin Downey, who I'll talk about a bit later, and I hope she's logged into this. Um, she has been a pioneer for OTs with FASD in Australia, and She's recently um, completed her PhD. So a lot of our Australian research with FASD has come from her. So we need to really um, give a big shout out to our great OTs in this industry because they don't always give themselves the best recognition and it really needs to be given. So while we jump into that, um, our OT's role with the diagnosis. So our role is with the motor skills assessment. So these are the most common um, assessments used um, for the diagnostic um, uh, the process that an OT will look at. So we've got the BOT2, please don't ask me to say the correct way to say it because I'm not very good at saying the lingo. <laughs> um, the movement assessment battery for children as well as the, um, the BERI VMI with the um, visual perceptual and motor coordination subtest. And what I've done again here is I've actually put in exactly what's from the diagnostic criteria. So this is what we're looking at. If you um, forget or you want to revise yourself, well, what is my role with this diagnosis? Flick to the um, diagnostic criteria and this is where you'll find the motor skills. So we've got the direct assessment of the BOT2, the BERI, um, and the movement assessment battery for children. So, and we will also talk about the indirect assessment. So, um, they may, um, a clinical assessment may provide supporting evidence of a severe impairment, so report a balance of problems, so kids, you know, won't quite sit for that um, assessment. Um, the standardised ones, we can do some indirect assessments, um, and this is um, all we, you can look at this yourself and become more um, familiar with it yourself as well. Um, it's all online, which is great. I don't need to read it, but I will talk about the considerations. So impairment um, may be evident in learning or play when motor skills level are one standard deviation below the mean. So we still need to put into play. So um, it's classed as severe, severe impairment if there's um, two standard deviations below the mean. Um, but, you know, as this says, impairment, or as the slide says, impairment may be evident in learning and play when motor skills are still at one standard deviation. So they still need to be supported. Um, they preferred to use a motor assessment which provides separate scores in fine and gross motor skills um, and overall may hide the individual strengths and weakness. So the BOT2 is um, really great at separating those scores of fine and gross motor skills. We might also have some musculoskeletal based structural impairments which may kind of hinder their motor skill work such as decreased supination, pronation of elbows and lack of or complete extension of digits. So that will impact on how they actually perform in these motor skills assessments. So definitely something to keep yourself familiar with and um, revise yourself if you are beginning to work with a child with FASD and looking at what neurodevelopmental impairment that they have, um, they have used for that diagnosis. So here we go, another big shout out to Robin Downey um, for her awesome work in FASD research and OT. It has been sensational and um, she's over in WA, so a big um, clap to her and we will all use and really appreciate her work. When, well, I, I definitely do when working with kids with FASD. So, prenatal alcohol exposure affects the function of the corpus callosum, the syrup, cerebellum, the motor cortex, and the basal ganglia. So in addition, this can lead to tremor, abnormal muscle developmental development, skeletal malformation, and impair, impaired nerve con conductivity. So this is just a quick excerpt of some 
some things to think of when developing interventions and strategies and working. These are, the, you know, the four brain areas that are most commonly affected. And these are additional things that can also go wrong um, as well that as OTs we really need to be looking at. So um, as we spoke about before with the, the BOT2, we do have a very big role to play in terms of the fine motor skills. So here is some um, excellent research. You'll know that I've probably referenced Robin throughout this um, slide about the impact on the fine motor skills. So we do know children with FASD have significantly lower fine motor composite scores um, and manual coordination scores than children without prenatal alcohol exposure. So specific areas that they most commonly have tr um, trouble with is fine motor speed, manual precision and coordinate arm and hand movements. Um, so that's a very specific area that children with FASD um, have issues with. And that, you know, as OTs, we can definitely be looking at improving. We also know that they have significantly poorer graphomotor skills, um, including delayed pencil grasp, heavy writing pressure, being uh, unable to write a sentence and having decreased word legibility. So um, when they were also assessed using the Beery VMI, um, children with prenatal alcohol exposure or FASD were two to three times more likely than children without prenatal alcohol exposure to draw shapes that were distorted, reversed or had dog earring errors, um, as opposed to those children without. They also, there is also quite a heavy impact on gross motor skills. Um, most clearly seen in individuals where the mother drank at moderate to heavy levels of um, maternal alcohol consumption. Um, this research is also come from Barbara Lucas, who is also a wonderful physiotherapist who has also been a pioneer in her field in doing lots of um, looking at the gross motor effects as well. So a lot of this research has come from her too. Um, and she has been um, a big advocate for um, FASD within the physiotherapy world, but there is a bit of a crossover in the sense that we're both looking at motor skills. And the physiotherapist can most certainly do a BOT2 assessment on a child um, to assess their gross motor skills if um, you're in an area where you don't have the scope to do it yourself. So um, because of those effects on the four parts of the brain we spoke about, um, gross motor skills affect um, balance, coordination, and ball skills, and running speed and agility. Um, in the, these studies, Specific common to fine and gross motor skills as we um, overlapping with Robin's uh, by manual coordination, reaction time involving complex tasks, timing, accuracy, and generation of isotonic and isometric force. So we're also going to speak about some sensory processing because this seems to be a very big area um, that affects children with FASD. And a lot of the time it can be um, a carer or a teacher's breaking point as they can't quite understand uh, what is happening, which I guess happens a lot with a lot of children with disabilities that have sensory processing issues. But um, we do have some research to show that children with FASD do demonstrate problem behaviours and sensory processing impairments. Um, and they do demonstrate poor sensory mod modulation um, for tactile, auditory, visual stimuli. They do show lots of sensory seeking behaviours and sensory under responsiveness. So it is a very big part of um, as they, it is not in the diagnostic criteria, but um, I think as a group, we can um, one day get there. Um, the more you work with children with FASD, you can see how they are profoundly affected in this area, and it can be a big area, um, a bigger signal for some clinicians when you start to work with more and more children. So another area that um, as OTs we will be looking at would be their executive functioning. And this can be one of the biggest um, difficulties and impact on function that a child with FASD has. Um, and this can lead to the difficulties with school, academic learning, having a job, um, house maintenance, um, their general hygiene. Um, so children with FASD more, more specifically have difficulties with um, set shifting, planning and strategy use and attention and spatial memory. And memory is a very, very big issue with FASD. They most often do not learn from punishment. They can't remember. Um, why, when, when they did something wrong um, and a good take home message is if they've done um, something wrong and they need to have a punishment or consequences, it really needs to happen then and there. Um, there is no point um, saying, um, you know, if they've done something wrong in the first period of school and then two hours later they are on detention at lunchtime, they're, they usually can't remember why they're on detention. Um, they can't remember the, the, you know, them smacking the person in the first period of school. Um, so it can be um, very problematic for those children. 
So, um, you know, difficulties with that executive functioning has been shown to um, affect social function and increase levels of child-related stress. So that it's really hard, especially for them, when all of their peers are achieving, like any other individuals with, dis with disabilities, um, and they're not quite meeting that. So as well as the memory deficits, if they can't quite remember what they did wrong or what the processes were, you know, the teacher might say, you, we've got over this and over and over again, and you're not quite getting it. But um, it's really their, their memory that's affecting them. And I, I was working with a young boy, and um, we were doing reading, and he could, we had, it was like the fox jumped over the dog. Um, just like that hand running speech test one, but um, he couldn't remember the the from the beginning of the sentence to the the in the middle of the sentence, and it was about three words away, um, and that was really difficult. And the teacher said it's so common, and he was in year two, so that was really affecting his academic learning. So um, just quickly, you know, as I tease, what can how can we help? We've got, we've got a lot of scope in this area, and I really do feel like we are the um, the forefront. For therapeutic intervention and I think we do a really great job of it as well. Um, I do think we need a lot more education about it ourselves about what we should be doing but as I said the research about intervention is actually quite limited so um, we do say you know if they're showing impulsive behaviours or hyperactive behaviours treat the behaviour um, but with having a FASD lens in mind. So with our role you know we have a big role to play in self-regulation, sensory processing, um, assisting with developmental delay, their fine and gross motor skills as we spoke about quite a lot. Um, helping with their social skills, that's a really big bit that's impacted upon as well as um, progressing their executive functioning skills. Um, and of course, there's, there's probably a lot more. This is what I put together about some of the most common things that I work on with the kids that um, present with FASD. So I will quickly touch on um, one intervention, which there has actually been some wonderful research coming out of called the ALERT program, which um, some of you will be very familiar with. So following the intervention, we found improvements in a number of areas of self-regulation skills, such as inhibition, parent-reported executive functioning, and skills in everyday life. So this is really exciting and promising research, and um, I would say that if you have a child that presents to, with self-regulation or behaviour issues, um, to try and jump on this program or get yourself to a training that does this program so you can um, compete as best as you can. Um, and hopefully we get some more research coming out um, further supporting this really great intervention. So just very, very quickly, um, we're just gonna talk about some of the secondary issues and challenges that an individual with FASD will face. Okay, so, um, a lot of these things can result from FASD due to, you know, the impact on those neurodevelopmental domains that really um, can limit them from participating as well as they can in their daily occupations and daily life. So um, there is a very strong correlation between illegal drug use um, and alcohol dependency for individuals with FASD. Not specifically, we don't really know exactly why, but we um, potentially there could be a biological link. Um, they may be growing up in environments where alcohol is um, consumed readily as well, um, but we do know there is a direct correlation. Uh, very common, as we spoke about, depression and anxiety, dropping out of school, breaking the law, um, isolating themselves, um, and withdrawing and avoiding if things just become very, very tricky for them. Anger and aggression is definitely one of the main reasons why they may present um, so heavily in our juvenile justice centres and our jail system. So, interestingly enough, um, medical and health professionals, we are not very confident about asking about alcohol use in pregnancy, which is not surprising. Um, and in, in a sense, it is um, an area that um, midwives and doctors and GPs really um, need a lot more work on as well about asking about alcohol during pregnancy. As, as it says, only 42% of allied health and medical professionals are confident about asking about alcohol use during pregnancy. Um, and 64% feel that they may um, may make a, feel, a parent feel judged or blamed. And that, that's completely understandable. But um, from all the latest statistics and research, we do know that we do need to be asking about alcohol use in pregnancy. And actually, women want to know. Um, pregnant women want to know what alcohol does during pregnancy and if it's going to harm their child. And if only if less than half of us are asking about it during pregnancy, then they aren't quite getting the correct information across. So, 
we really need to also look at our kids this Thursday and our individuals this Thursday, but they have a lot of strengths and, you know, it can be really tricky and really tiring. And as a therapist, um, you don't always get those, those lovely games you get with some other kids with um, disabilities and it can be quite um, disheartening at times and very overwhelming, especially if you've never worked with these children before and you all of a sudden have this um, sudden influx of clients. So um, it's really important to work towards their strengths as us OTs will do really great at. Um, to give them the best opportunity um, for, for their future life. So um, far more than would be expected, we have lots and lots of strengths. So often um, they're very creative, um, very good with music. Um, if they don't have gross motor impairment, they can often be quite athletic and this is, can at times be their um, outlet um, for all of their built up emotions and frustrations. Um, very artistic, if um, they don't have fine motor impairment, um, very good at creating really good stories or um, painting as well. They're always very willing um, and helpful. So you will often find that children with FASD would always like to please, which at times can be quite a negative for them because they will say yes to anything and do anything for anyone, but they don't quite have the social judgment if that person has the best interest for them. And that is where sometimes we get the um, information about the early child um, parenthood um, with people with FASD um, because uh, often a young girl who is living with FASD would like to um, please her boyfriend at the time and she um, says yes and then we have um, early parenthood essentially. But, you know, as that, that can be a bit of a negative, but they're also very willing to get them to help you out in your sessions, get them to um, carry things for you. Um, give them special jobs because they super, super love that. So very quickly, we are coming to an end soon. Um, we do have our Australian Diagnostic Centres. Um, so we have um, the Cicada Centre, at, which is at Westmead Children's Hospital in Sydney, New South Wales. We have Patches Paediatrics in WA, um, as well as the Child Developmental Service on the Gold Coast. So they're our big um, centres and our, our multidisciplinary team. Um, but this is a very big question I get. Do they need a diagnosis, uh, diagnostic team for diagnosis? So this is no. So we have, um, what we are really trying to push is allied health professionals such as ourselves to become aware of the diagnostic criteria and um, doing our part. So as an OP, um, I can do the bot too. Um, our local speechy, she will do her speech assessment. The psychologist um, will also have her role to do on um, establishing cognition and looking at the executive functioning um, and they, we will put our, our team results together and then it may be sent off to those big diagnostic teams or it might be taken to the local paediatrician and he will do the final um, look at the facial features and some of the medical side of things and the diagnosis will go from there. So that is a big thing that I really want to push. They don't need to always go to these big centres. Um, we can start to get the ball rolling ourselves um, in the community. And hang on, there's space. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> so, <coughs> oh, excuse me again. <laughs> okay, so just something to finish up with. Um, whether they know it or not, this is a lovely quote. Community service providers are often working with people with FASD. So if we accept that 40 to 50% of pregnancies are unplanned, it may that a lot of exposure um, occurs without knowledge of pregnancy. So, you know, Australian research has variously predicted that as many as 80% of pregnancies may have been exposed to some level of alcohol. So working within the community, um, we definitely need to be FASD aware and developing strategies and interventions to best suit our um, lovely clients. So um, that was the end. Um, it was, it was um, a one hour, um, webinar but I'm very open to questions. Um, I can see your screen but um, and I may I I'm not sure if I can see your Q&A questions but I have a QA and a box so um, I'm not quite sure Carla if I will be able to have a look or not. Hi um, if any questions come through I'll read them out to you. Cool, thank you. No
Oh, this is a very good question. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, do you know how the diagnostic services are funded? Um, I couldn't give you a definite yes or no answer on that one. Um, I'm not quite aware of the funding of these diagnostic services. Um, I'm probably the most familiar with the one in um, New South Wales, and I do believe they are funded by um, Department of Health, but this is not ongoing funding as well. So, um, but I can definitely look into that further for you. And if you'd like me to get back to you, I would. Um, I can ask some people from NoFASD to confirm that for you. Yes, you can definitely get my reference list. I didn't actually attach it to my um, slides when I submitted it. So I can get that to you. I'll send them off to OT Australia and um, they can pass it on to you guys. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, I hope it was informative, but I'm always open to feedback. So. Um, I would like to always improve these webinars and this was my first webinar um, and I do apologise for that first technical glitch. Um, but any any um, feedback, positive or negative, will be warmly welcomed. Um, I do, I'm aware that I'm a very fast talker at times and I do apologise. But um, I really appreciate so many people jumping on board on this webinar and I think it's so great to see so much interest within the OT community. So also, if um, you guys were looking at emailing me directly, I'm also more than happy for you guys to do that, or you can just jump on the NoFAS the Australia website um, as well, and you'll be able to get in contact with me. But also, I forgot to um, mention that um, we have a really wonderful um, website as well, which has lots of resources for it. Um, for FASD, if you would like to print them out for your um, families, parents, teachers, or you need to direct your um, families um, to some further information. We also have a hotline um, that carers, teachers, individuals can call as well as if you guys have some questions you can call that hotline and they'll pass you on to me. Um, and also um, there is some online modules for FASD that is run by the Telethon Kids Institute so if you jump onto that website you can have access to them too. Um, but thank you Robin. Uh, I'm glad that I addressed the role of OT in diagnosis. Um, I found when I first started working with kids with OT, um, with FASD, that um, I wasn't quite aware of what we were quite doing. And I really had to, luckily from the lovely help from Diana Barnett from the Westmead Children's Hospital, as well as chatting with um, Robin Janney later. But um, without that diagnostic criteria, I think we were a little bit lost for a while, but now we've got that, which has been wonderful. And we have a little, more, little bit more direction, but thank you, Robin, again. Okay, I think that's it. Yep. Uh, thank you to everyone for your attendance tonight and a big thank you to Jessica for an excellent webinar. Um, just a reminder that this webinar was recorded and it will be sent out to all registrants via email by this Thursday, the 8th of February. So thank you again, Jessica. Thank you, Carla. And thank you, everyone. So I'm sorry about the technical difficulties as well. <laughs> Thanks everyone, good night.